Well, thank you, Bob. And thank you, everybody. Um, it's a bit awesome here, a bit out of my, bit out of my routine, um, and I hope I can do justice to it tonight. It's, uh, it's very awesome with all the distinguished people here. Um, and without, I mean, Joan and Tim, but uh, Energy Minister Mikel, I have to mention, uh, who, who was minister throughout all the period where ERM really, really grew in its straps, um, invested a lot of money in Queensland and uh, helped Queensland become. But, but, but t tonight, um, uh, tonight I, I, I'm, and I'll, I'll look forward to Q and A because I'll probably do better on Q and A. So, I'll, but, but I've, I've, uh, what I want to do is tonight is to give you a personal view through the lens of my own experience of, of how public and private enterprise can work together to build wealth and and also how it how it can be destroyed. Um, I, I, the address that I have is ostensibly how best to capture the enterprise potential of a community for the development of the state and for the public good, um, which which is is what, as I read, Sir Thomas McElrath and Benver has told us, um, is what Sir Thomas was renowned for. I want to start with one of the most progressive achievements of the last year of last year's Sir Thomas McElwraith lecture, lecturer, Celia Hilshire. On behalf of the state, he negotiated for non-coking, non-coking steaming coal tops over the open-cut coking coal at the Utah Development Company's Blackwater Mine um, to be sold to the state, free on rail at a net cost of otherwise not disposing of it as waste. This was to support what was then uh, then to be a discounted electricity generation and supply price to a possible Gladstone alumin, a big smelter at, at Gladstone. As a five-year newcomer to, the, to Queensland in 1974, appointed to set up a new resources division in the State Electricity Commission, my first job was to project manage the construction of the crushing and net and coal loading facility for the Blackwater Steaming Coal Tops and to administer the supply contract of the state. I, I will remember the shock horror reaction of the Blackwater Mine Manager that a mere government employee would refuse to approve the, the very fair $20 a tonne invoice uh, from the Blackwater Coal Company, um, n nor approve any invoice uh, above the approximate one dollar a tonne net price negotiated by Salio. In, in the event, despite the, the usual representations to all and sundry uh, that you'd expect from a, a big coal company like that, um, Utah Development Company got paid one dollar a tonne. That was three and a half cents a kilowatt hour, three and a half cents a gigajoule um, for one and a half million tonnes of coal per annum for as long as the Blackwater tops needed to be removed to uncover the prized coking coal for export. This enabled the Queensland Government to offer blocks of low-priced power from, the, from an extension of the new Gladstone power station to a consortium of international partners with Comalco to commit to the construction of the Boyne Island aluminium smelter at Gladstone. It would be the largest smelter in Australia, employing a thousand permanent direct staff, direct workers, and creating this major new industrial centre in Queensland. This was very much in the mould of, of uh, Thomas McElwraith. I then had the role of implementing the transformation of coal procurement for all state electricity generation in Queensland. This involved negotiating with the coal owners and unions and coal mining unions to end the Queensland Coal Board's oversight and, and determination of coal supply allocations and supply prices for all coal supplies for power generation on a six-month basis. None of, them had a, none of them had an overdraft, let alone a, a financing agreement. 
and and Australia and Queensland was the highest electricity supply cost state in the whole of Australia, except when oil prices went up and Western Australia might be a little bit higher than Queensland. And I also had the job of negotiating long-term contracts for supply in place of getting rid of the Queensland Coal Board. I had the job of calling tenders for coal for new power stations, leading to construction of new low-cost mine site power stations at Tarong and at Calide B. And, and more importantly, I had, uh, I had the job of readying, of, of actually readying the coal, the Curra coal resources for tender to supply uh, half the coal as 50% non-coking coal um, to the State Electricity Commission at a discounted price for the, for the next new power station, which would be at Stanmore. Curra deserves special mention. It, it involved an area north of Utah's Blackwater mine, which it had relinquished as not prospective enough for coking coal. I organised for the State Electricity Commission to acquire the um, exploration licence, prove up the resource as a 50% steaming, non-coking steaming coal and 50% ex coking coal export fraction and managing a tender for its sale on the basis of the lowest price um, to the State Electricity Commission for the 50% of steaming coal to supply the, the, the Stanwell power station. It ended up with four and a half million tonnes of coal to be exported as coking coal and four and a half million tonnes of discounted electricity price for the Stanwell power station. So, so we had cheap coal at a dollar a tonne onto rail to Gladstone, and we had four and a half million tonnes of half price coal to Stanwell. The successful planning and construction of the Gladstone power station, the interconnection by high voltage uh, transmission from the Central Electricity Board uh, south to the, Southern Electric, to the Southern Electric Authority of Queensland and north to the Northern Electricity Authority of Queensland to all be merged into the Queensland Electricity Board and the establishment of Gladstone as a major industrial centre with the construction of the major aluminium smelter was part of one of the most outstanding two decades of development of this state. Development by public enterprise and private enterprise working together under the premiership of Sir Job Jockey Peterson. Within a decade of the transformation of coal procurement, electricity generation in costs in Queensland improved from the most expensive of all states in, two, in 1975 to the lowest of all states in 1985. At the same time as reducing electricity sector debt to minimal levels and returning the greatest dividend returns to the Queensland Government plus equity debt swaps while maintaining the lowest debt gearings of all states for the for state-owned electricity invest businesses at normally 33%. It, 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 was a, it was a wonderful backing for a government. This may not this may not have been the enterprise innovation story that you might have been expecting me to start with, but it has always underlined for, for me that private enterprise has its own failings and deficiencies, as does public enterprise, and both have to be nurtured for productive outcomes and for the common good. The Jockey Peterson era in the 1970s and the 1980s were decades of outstanding development, as were the decades of the 1880s and 1890s um, of the McElroyth era. And the recorded description of McElroyth as a big man with big ideas, who was rugged and masterful, possibly on occasions not over scrupulous, with a habit of getting his own way by sheer force of character rather than by intellectual ability, uh, but for 25 years, one of the greatest personalities in Queensland, that's, that's as quoted, uh, may very well have been written to describe Sir Joe Jockey Peterson, in my view. More to the point, the Jockey Peterson era directed by outstanding State Department heads at the time. I mean, let's think of them. Sir, Sir Sidney Schubert, Celia Hilshire. Um, Jack Woods, 
Doug Murray, MC, and Neil Galway delivered growth, development, and public benefit across the state and provided that well-managed public enterprise um, and proved that well-managed public enterprise is as important for the public good as well-managed <coughs> private enterprise. The mismanagement of the State Electricity Commissions of New South Wales, Victoria, and also of the Electricity Trust of South Australia at the time in the 1980s and into the 1990s were examples of failures of public enterprise. Not only did this lead to the growth and emergency of Queensland as the development powerhouse of Australian states, but it was the genesis of the, the competition law of the 1990s, providing a level playing field for private sector power generators, um, producers, in competition with government-owned corporations. And this eventually led to the establishment of the national electricity market in New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. And, uh, and the interconnection of Queensland uh, in, into the NEM in 2002 and Tasmania years later. In most states, the open and competitive generation and retail, the, in, in most states, the open and competitive generation and retail sectors were sold to private sectors companies, bringing great price benefits to electricity consumers for nearly two decades while but while generation, generous generation supply-demand balances existed, and these existed largely as a result of the major refurbishments undertaken on acquisition by the private sector um, and, and the greatly improved operation and business performances under, under private enterprise control compared to, the, to the, what, what were really failing um, public sector ownership at the time. But the sale of the state-owned monopoly transmission and distribution networks um, and assets as regulated monopolies was a disaster for electricity consumers. Network prices grew to be even greater than wholesale generation prices because of demonstrable poor regulation and government imposition of supply reliability rules where you had investors being guaranteed um, returns on any money they could justify spending. But to move to the private sector and private enterprise, I left the Queensland Le the public sector in 1980 to join the then well-known uh, Queensland private sector entrepreneur Ian Howard Smith in an ultimately unsuccessful bid to develop an export coal project. It had a little sting in it too, because I, I wrote to Sir Joe as Premier, um, uh, thinking that instead of instead of um, favouring um, uh, uh, Howard Smith's uh, uh, father-in-law, he should he should um, support Young Turks, and and that letter became a little bit of a thing that that sort of had political implications. <laughs> for, for nearly a decade later, the media would ring me up from time to time, wanting to know what I meant by that. But anyway. <laughs> The company vehicle which I established for this bid, Energy Resource Management Private Limited, was to become 28 years later Air and Power for Private Limited and then Air and Power Limited. I have a problem with glasses. I can, <laughs> I'm definitely reading with the glasses and without them. But anyway, I subsequently set up my, my card table in a two room office in Eagle Street as principal of Australia's first energy consulting practice here and consultants, and this quickly grew to 17 highly qualified and skilled energy analysts, electricity fuel utilisation specialists, and generation development and supply consultants. We consulted the public and private clients nationally and internationally for a decade. This was a time of totally, of totally technology agnostic electricity generation planning, evaluating the competing costs of different fuels for generation at different locations to get to demand centres at lowest cost against competing primary energy sources, different fuels and different generation technologies. Optimum generation for fuel technologies were mainly indigenous coal and gas for our generation in Australia. Internationally traded coal and LNG were becoming increasingly competitive around the world. ERM Consultants became a leading advisor and consultant internationally, supporting Australia's rapidly emerging steaming coal export industry in the 1980s 
and consulting internationally on new generation planning and development and coal utilisation testing for a number of coals from, from Australia and also from Indonesia. This was a far cry from, <clears throat> from government mandating and subsidising of renewable generation technology today, producing grossly suboptimal electricity price outcomes from the wrong generation fuel, from the wrong generation fuel and technology mixes, and at the expense of electricity consumers, particularly Australian businesses struggling with internationally uncompetitive energy costs. This is epitomised by uh, this is epitomised in the protests from so-called developers of wind and and solar generation projects with government legislated subsidies, claiming that they had no way of knowing that they would be up for the costs of getting their renewable generation from remote locations to city electricity customers. Really? I mean, this is a generation planning 101 development concept hurdle. After 1990, I reduced the consultancy arm of the business, concentrating more on my enterprise arm, energy resource managers, and, uh, and was ultimately successful in winning one of the first private power development uh, opportunities in Australia with a bid for a gas fine power station at Oki. My backers for the Oki power station bid uh, to the Queensland Government, that is Siemens and the Australian Industry Development Corporation, were the most surprised at, at our win. I might say that the joint venture that the joint venture process to then deliver the project and the business case was a test of steel for this new start generation business development entrepreneur at the mercy of such major partners, heavyweights, um, trotted in to, to make a real business of the business that, uh, that um, I won for them and, and for us to collectively. It was, it was a test I must have passed as my ERM power ended up as 100% owner of the asset 13 years later. That is, I wasn't, I wasn't pushed out as usually happens to new starts. <laughs> what a contrast it is today. 15 months ago, the ACCC reported to the Government of Australia that the energy on the national electricity market did not have the capacity to attract essential long-term finance for essential baseload dispatchable generation, um, resulting in baseload generation deficiencies following the closures of the Northern and Hazelwood power stations, and that this in turn threatened the viability of Australian businesses with high and, un high and unreliable and internationally uncompetitive electricity supply prices. The ACCC went on to recommend that the federal government underwrite beyond the term of offtake contracts with commercial and industrial customers, the long-term debt financing proportion of new capital intensive dispatchable power, supp power supply of whichever technology can secure offtake contracts of up to five years um, into the future with, with CNI customers. Shockingly, or maybe that's too much of a word, Despite expressions of interest being invited 11 months ago, the underwriting process is still tied up in bureaucratic knots, with no indication that Australian businesses can expect any future of stable, internationally competitive, 24-7 electricity supply on which to plan any ongoing investment in their businesses. It is history now that my family-owned enterprise company, uh, in partnership initially with ARDC successor Babcock and Brown, went on to produce um, produce half to, to create half the scheduled generation constructed in Australia in the 2000s, of which um, former Minister McKell was was um, involved, not involved, but there, with ERM Power Pro Limited. Uh, being created to construct and operate these power stations. Later, ERM Power took its ownership share of the partnership, expanded downstream into retailing, as, as Bob has said, uh, to the commercial industrial sector, winning a 20% share of that market um, from a standing start in less than five years. It listed on the ASX as ERM Power Limited and is still the second largest um, electricity retailer to business 
electricity customers in Australia and a strong competitive force keeping business energy retail and gross margins at low and competitive rates. I mean, business has a retail gross margin of less than half a cent a kilowatt hour and mass market has a has a retail gross margin of between 10 and 10 and 20 times that 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 gross margin it's because of the inefficiencies of a government interfering in mass market of course whereas the business energy market is 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 a fully um, open competitive uh, business ERM had a lot of scale and diversity but we were never daunted by it headquartered in Brisbane we had developed more than four billion dollars of investments across the country uh, came to turn over $3 billion per annum in our retail arm. We were also a gas explorer and producer um, in Western Australia. At one time, we were the nation's largest gas pipeline developer and, uh, and also a transmission li line developer. The, the takeover of ERM Power by Shell Energy Australia is a testament to the ERM organisation, its personnel, its business strategies, and its direction. To some extent, generally under the radar of public attention, Shell Energy has the potential to take ERM to another level in the sector for the good of industry and electricity customers as a result of the greater level of competition Shell Energy will be able to venture into. And the government and the business community in Queensland will hope that the business continues to benefit from being headquartered in Brisbane. The ERM power business will benefit um, going out of the public listed space by not having ASX 300 analysts telling shareholders how the company should be run. <laughs> Although I believe that the business will miss the counsel of one of the best team of directors in the energy sector. The ERM story is test testimony uh, to the important ingredient of new business development. That is, stick to what you know and make sure you know you, you, you really know your business. There are other observations on successful private entrepreneurship and, and the public good that, um, that it can deliver that I guess I've, I'm, well, I've been asked to reflect on in this address uh, from my experience in founding Air and Power, in resuscitating a loss-making Delta Electricity, which I acquired with, uh, from New South Wales government in a separate partnership and in mentoring a whole range of new start energy innovation companies through R&D commercialisation in the St Baker Energy Innovation Fund, if I may, as follows. I mean, these are all textbook stuff, I guess. You know, fair and equitable and ethical leadership is fundamental to engaging and retaining committed teams to create successful businesses. And I can only revert to, to the the, um, the the department directors um, in, in that Joe era, who who really worked 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 the business outcomes uh, for the Joe era, respect and concern for others at all levels in growing organisations is what it is vital in avoiding the factions that can develop in larger companies and in public enterprises and the public service. I concur with the Warren Buffett quote that businesses run by able and owner-oriented people are more likely to deliver enduring competitive advantage, although this can only be an objective test, uh, not a subjective t assessment. In my experience, executive leadership is where the executive leadership is where the, the most able and competent business skills are required, but there must be, they must be tempered by owner, owner, major investor-oriented direction at board level, of course, um, in consultation with able and competent financial and legal experienced people. Entrepreneurship is a most subjective capability and is an entirely different capability at, at the founding and R&D level from the commercial uh, business case evaluation level and from the marketing and profitable production and sale level. There are different entrepreneurial challenges uh, that unfold along the path of a profitable business. Having been a founder myself, I can, I can say that 
one of the most complex questions in progressing the commercialization and business development of a new start company is where best for the founders to reside in the different stages of business, business investment. So, so what of what of what of supply of, of electricity supply for the future, which is the the thing I guess I'm I'm more famous about <laughs> commenting on at the moment, and maybe of more of interest to you tonight. We have to convince Australian governments that the current policies are just are just loading up with wind and solar and allowing other technologies to, to wither is not sustainable. Internationally, intermittent wind and solar are not, are not projected to supply more than 25% annually anytime soon. The International Energy Agency's latest projections are, are for 50% zero emission energy um, sources for the electricity sector globally by 2040, 20 years time. Made up of, and, and that 50% of zero emission is made up of 22% sun and wind and 28% nuclear and hydro. The 28% is dispatchable, is dispatchable and, and, uh, and the, the other 50% is fossil fuels. That's what the, the rest of the globe is, is looking, is, is, is looking at in 20 years' time, and and slowly, and the sun and wind won't change much after that. Well, it can, and I'll come to that. Bloomberg Energy project that electricity will increase from 35% of global energy sources to more like 60% of global energy sources by 2060, um, with the electrification of the transport sector and the fixed energy sector. I mean, we are moving into a totally electrified world. Um, it's happening. Um, it's not going to be hydrogen, it's going to be electric, and hydrogen might have its role, but um, it's just a distraction. While Australia is already close to achieving the 22% that the rest of the world will have in 20 years' time uh, of wind and solar, more than double what the rest of the world has today, uh, but with only 8% hydro capability and, uh, and a nuclear power generation ban, um, it is difficult for Australia to achieve a much greater than 35% zero emission generation from, from 22, 25% sun and wind and 8 and 10% um, uh, hydro is all we have for the electricity sector. And it will therefore be reliant on fossil fuels for up to 65% of total electricity generation um, if we just follow the rest, of, well, in, in 20, with, with, without an economical energy storage solution and, and, and of an increasing electricity proportion. And, and we have to deal with that. That's 50% of, of an increasing proportion of electricity of total energy use in Australia, the same as the rest of the world. Electricity supply grids need synchronous generation supply for at least 40% of electricity demand at any time. And intermittent non-synchronous wind and solar um, at around 30% annual capacity factor, uh, effectively, typically, can su cannot supply much more than 20% than of annual electricity demand in any interconnected electricity zone anywhere in the world without such an, ec an economic energy storage solution, and certainly not across the Australian continent. And nowhere in the world is pump storage promoted as a major solution to base loading intermittent wind and solar to, to much more than the 25% the that it can naturally supply in the present um, uh, without other energy storage solutions. Certainly, in respect of pump storage, certainly the flattest and driest cotton in the world is not going to lead the world with a pumped, a pumped hydro energy storage solution to increase the annualised wind and solar uh, generation above the 20%. It's simply not going to happen. And, and we, we have the industry fund's chief economist um, with a 104-page report um, saying the same thing. The, the, the main 
The main ones worried are those who've invested in wind and sun who can see more and more oversupply coming across the grid, simply destroying their own business cases and, uh, and marginalising their own investments, including the investments of, of, of workers' funds in the industry super funds. Electrification of the transport sector, however, will come mainly from solar in the middle of the day and will enable more wind at night. It has the capacity to lift the cap on wind and solar from the 20%, from the 20%, 25% annually to somewhere towards 40%. And the batteries on wheels that will, that with the uptake of EVs and, the crea and, the, and the, with the creation of DC platforms in premises where EVs will be on, on longer, slow charging and connected for longer times, um, once able to be connected to the grid, will transition electricity retailing, further increasing the potential contribution from wind and solar, possibly to, to more than 50% annually. So all that can come that way. And why is, why is Shell buying into ERM? Why is Shell announcing it's going to be the largest electricity retailer in the world when it hasn't, from a standing start? It's because, it's because the electrification of the transport sector is going to transform electricity retailing. Electrification of transport and fixed fuel sectors have the potential, therefore, to increase electricity demand in Australia by more than 50%, with wind and solar accounting for half that increased electricity demand and total zero emission generation accounting for probably 55 to 60% of that larger amount. But coal will be a major portion of the non-zero emission portion of this, this increasing electricity generation demand for many decades into the future for Australia. And we have to nurture such capability for it to be economical and as clean as possible and, co <clears throat> and convince the public that this is the part of the more action on climate change that is necessary not shutting down power stations and businesses in Australia as the zealots would have. If Australians want to seriously reduce CO2 emissions, then nuclear power ge uh, generation needs to be part of that mix. And, and, by, and as Bob said, my SMR Nuclear Technology Propriety Limited uh, which has been batting away quietly for, um, for about six years now, is breaking new ground in getting the nuclear ban in Australia removed with parliamentary inquiries at both federal and New South Wales state levels. And that's not where will the power station, where will the nuclear power stations be? It, w it will be that, that, that if there's a op business opportunity, it can be investigated and, and explored like everywhere else in the world. Um, in respect of the electrification of the transport sector, two of the best performing startups backed by my St Baker Energy Innovation Fund are Tritium and EV Networks. Since selling its first electric DC fast charger in January 2015, two years later and still today, Tritium became the, the technological leader and major international supplier of of electric vehicle DC fast and ultra fast chargers in global markets, all developed, manufactured, and imported and, and exported, not import, exported from Brisbane. Tritium has more than 3,000 charging stations in 26 countries. Its head office and R&D and test facilities are at Murray in Brisbane, with manufacturing spread across uh, Brisbane, Amsterdam, and Los Angeles, where the assemblies go on there. I, I, they, they won a, Kim Carr um, takes pride in being a creator of Tritium because he was one who signed the, in 2013, I think, the Commonwealth commercialization grant for them to commercialize, to design and commercialize a DC fast charger. And they, they had to get new investors to match it and, 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 and take it forward further. And that was how they came across me, who'd been an who'd been an advocate of um, 
of, of EV fast charging, and I was the first to put EV chargers with free with free ERM power in the King George car park. Um, and uh, when when the only cars used to turn up were my car and um, and ERM's uh, EV car at the time, but but they came along, and I invested in them in 2013. Um, invested in three three founders, three staff in a shed in in Tennyson. And then now the world's leader in this one of the one of the major um, uh, exercises. And tritium ultrafast charges are being constructed in 240 highway service stations throughout Europe in an export achievement that has won for tritium well-deserved export achievement awards. And but we've gone further. We've now set up EV networks. E EV networks. It, 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 it buys the, ch the charges and it installs them, and and uh, that's a hundred percent fund my fund owned company. We've committed fifty five million to building for the first forty two ultra fast charging stations similar to those charging stations around Europe. Maybe only two charges instead of six to start with, um, and and, uh, and our first one is being officially opened. Uh, by Mark Butler, the Energy Minister, um, on the 31st of October, north of Caboolture, halfway between here and Noosa, and uh, and that will help connect the the the, the highway, the, the the 50 kilowatt, what, what we call city top-up ch stations that um, that the uh, uh, government has bought from Tritium and built uh, with Eureka up, up the up the coast of Queensland, and Queensland. Um, will lead will lead the country in in providing a really electrified superhighway to overcome the the fit, the distant the you know um, getting home anxiety whatever you call it uh, and and triggering the uptake of vehicles uh, and other I mean the, the fund I have to, to do a bit of showing off I guess is uh, with EV networks but we've invested in Novonics which has over 30 years combined experience in battery research, cell testing and materials development and is, and, is, is, and is building a factory in Tennessee. The factory has negotiated the 100 megawatt 51% capacity factor contract for electricity to supply to them at one and a half cents a kilowatt hour for off-peak power. If, if they want power around the clock, just a, a, a flat rate, it's five and a half cents a kilowatt hour, and 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 we have discussions in Australia with all the boffins in the world, deciding that what Australia is going to do different to the rest of the world, whereas we should be looking at the rest of the world and wondering why you can buy electricity for a hundred megawatt factory in Tennyson, and I can quote that because that's the Novonics building an anode creation factory in Tennessee. It's a it's a scandal in Australia. We're, we're, we're investing in pure EVs, which is, which is contracted to, with another party to, to actually, and we're actually supplying the first 500 electric trikes, which are the, which are the local urban buses in Philippines to one city. Um, and these are nine seater clean electric trikes replacing those gas guzzling diesel, <laughs> dirty, dirty diesel things that are polluting the Philippines air. And there's only a million that, that we can, that we can try to replace them all. But I think we've got a, a, a profit making business out of our first 500 and we're now signing the contract for the next thousand. It's just a wonderful business. We're, we're launching this week Careware Australia. We're a 38% shareholder in in in, um, in Careware, started out of Reno, with people in in um, injury relief, and and we use another company I've invested in, Clyde, um, which we now control and I chair, that produces manufactures printed light, um, printed. LEDs the size of five blood vessels in, in a semiconductor ink. And what Careware have done is, is they have patches with, with red light, blue light, or green light that has different power effects on muscles. And, uh, and the red light will get blood flowing again. It's not new, but this is pulsing, pulsing, um, red light on a patch on your arm. And uh, and we're just and we're launching Careware Australia, and we've just got a video now. Mater tested it before our directors came out to launch Careware Australia. We're just doing really 
um, tri uh, tri um, trials, they, they have this picture of someone after a knee operation um, standing up in, in, th in, in so many minutes. They stood up once. And, and, and after a week of, of these patches, uh, patches in the right place to, 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 for pain relief, it's a non-opioid pain reliever to, uh, to, uh, and, and, and she's standing up and down as though she never had an operation. And it wasn't just because of the week that transpired. We, we, we've got the, we've got the, um, the Mayor of Blacktown Council, who's the former uh, head of the AW in New South Wales, who's, who reckons that that blue-collar workers are, are, are the most likely to deny pain, and then when they really decided, they're the most likely to pop a pill early and be addicted to opioids. And he reckons it should be these should be in in in, in every uh, workplace agreement. And uh, and we're presenting to both my coal-fired power station Delta Electricity and the mine that we've now acquired next to it called Delta Coal. Um, and uh, and we're putting these in there, but these, the the and we have printed energy and other businesses. The challenge in the challenges in power generation we face are huge, but history suggests that governments and entrepreneurs working together are up up to, to those challenges. It also suggests that it doesn't happen by accident, but takes leadership. Queensland has led in the past, and it can do so again. If we can solve the challenges here, the rest of Australia will follow. They've done it before. Thank you.